Um, I guess we'll kick it off here. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Nielsen, and I'm the marketing coordinator at Eco Engineers. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the third and final installment of our Crystal Ball series. Our first webinar in December of last year covered the RNG marketplace and its varying emerging markets. And then we followed up in January with a look back and a look forward at the ethanol industry, including low carbon farming practices and carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, our crystal ball webinars uh, also talked about the changing administration and how the impact, how, how the changing administration could impact the future of low carbon fuels. Our previous webinars in the series have been posted to our YouTube account, so you can make sure to check those out if those topics are of interest. Today, um, you will hear about uh, the biodiesel and renewable diesel space, but I do want to uh, talk about a couple of housekeeping items before we start. We will have a Q&A session in the last 20 to 30 minutes of the, of the webinar. So feel free to type your questions into the chat function. I think it should say questions on your GoToWebinar uh, little toolbar there uh, during the presentation. And we'll try to answer as many as we can before our time is over here today. Uh, as usual, the webinar will be recorded and will be shared in the weeks following the event. And you will re also receive a link for a survey at the end when you close all out of the webinar and also in a follow-up email. We just wanna know what you thought of it, if you have any suggestions for future webinars, or if you uh, wanna reach out and talk to any of our experts uh, about any of the services that we offer. So before I hand it over to Roxby Hartley, our biodiesel LOB manager, I want to play a brief video explaining how eco engineers can help you in this low carbon world. Carbon is the biggest disruptor of the 21st century, and the world as we know it is changing. Eco engineers can guide you to make the best decisions as you navigate toward your clean energy goals. A diverse team of carbon analysts, engineers, scientists, auditors, and regulatory specialists are trusted advisors of the clean energy fuel sectors worldwide. Clean energy regulations are a maze. We simplify them with an unbiased approach and fully manage your compliance. Modeling your carbon reduction is complicated. We quantify your emissions with a rigor based in science. Together, we can create markets that will protect and grow your investment. We create sustainable solutions for a better tomorrow. We are Eco Engineers. All right, Roxby, uh, I'll kick it off to you and you can uh, introduce our speakers and talk a little bit more about Eco Engineers. Well, thanks for watching the video, everybody, and thank you, Lindsay. Um, that's really Eco Engineers in a nutshell. Uh, we're, we're really lucky here. We see the clean energy economy happening. Uh, we touch a significant number of the projects in the US and everything from a biodiesel plant looking for auditors to a brand new company looking to bring a new fuel type uh, into the US or into California. Uh, because we're in touch with so many of the projects, we, we get to see the nitty gritty of, of, of what's going on, the get deep into the regulations. And because we see so many projects, we get to see a little further into the future than I think most people do. Uh, our experience in helping our clients is uh, really distilled down into uh, six separate areas. And we find that these are the areas that businesses have to have competence in or need help in to manage their transition to the low carbon economy. And those areas are uh, learning the marketplace and the regulations that are driving the change, measuring carbon footprints, uh, interfacing with the regulators, uh, building assets, managing carbon compliance, uh, and securing third party certifications and audits. Uh, and that's, that is Eco Engineers. And from that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, that's myself, Roxby Hartley. I'm the uh, line of business manager, like uh, Lindsay said, for biodiesel and renewable diesel. Uh, with me, I have Andrew Clapp, who is an auditor. He's my uh, counterpart on the auditing side and manages the biodiesel and renewable audits. And then we have Sarah Carswell, who is uh, experienced with lobbying and with guidance through regulations. And she's going to give us insights into the regulatory changes that might be coming up. So today we're going to have a look back as to what happened uh, in uh, with biodiesel and renewable diesel. 
I look forward to what we think will happen. We'll look at the emerging markets for that are coming up, uh, talk about the new Biden administration, and we're going to look at uh, the new audit regulations that have come about and, and the impact that they're going to have. Okay, so let's talk about what happened on the rim prices. Uh, well, as I think everybody knows, rim prices are in an upward trend. There wasn't a significant hit on the D4, D5 prices uh, from COVID, as you can see from the graph. Uh, if you compare with an ethanol graph, you can see that the green line on this, uh, then you can see that there was a big drop in the prices in Q1 and Q2. But the biodiesel RINs and the renewable diesel RINs carried on on the upward trend. Um, and then we can look at the LTFS uh, credit price history. This is for California. And this graph stretches back to January 14 up to Q3 last year. And as you can see that the credit prices have tracked up to close to $200 a ton. There was a small, there's a small blip in Q1, Q2 this year from impacts from the pandemic. But prices are trading closer to their cap and we'll probably continue on that trend. Uh, for RIN generation, this is what uh, fuels contributed to the RINs in biomass-based diesel last year. As you can see, the biggest gallon contributor was domestic biodiesel. Imported biodiesel was about uh, 200 million gallons. Domestic RD and foreign RD uh, were similar, uh, about 480 and 357 million gallons. gallons. And renewable jet was a small contributor. Um, the amount of gallons exceeded the RVO. Uh, there was a few D6 RINs generated, um, and uh, domestic RD production is close to the nameplate name capacity of the domestic RD plant. Um, COVID impacts were not as significant as for the gasoline industry. Uh, this is the California uh, LTRS market, but this is broken down into which fuels contributed the most metric tons. Now, as you can see, um, as you can see, the uh, the largest contributor it was renewable diesel over the last few quarters. It overtook ethanol, uh, and biodiesel also has been ramping up its. Uh, uh, it's metric tons of contribution. And this isn't with uh, CI changes. This isn't generating more metric tons on the same gallons. This is simply because there are more gallons coming to California. Biodiesel was expanding quite slowly up to the beginning of 2020. And since then, there has been um, a change in the regulation in California, which was for allowing over 5% blends of biodiesel in underground storage tanks. And that, and I think the fact that some of the truck stops in California have uh, executive orders to allow higher blends, uh, that both those factors have contributed to that increase. And that's likely to continue as well. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew Clapp now for the LCFS verification update, and this is important. This is this is back to the nitty gritty of what we were talking about at the beginning of the presentation. Thanks, Roxby. Uh, as Roxby said, I'm Andrew Clapp. I am the compliance auditor and team lead here at Eco Engineers for the the biodiesel and renewable diesel audits that we do, mainly in the in the RFS QAP and and now starting in 2020, the uh, LCFS verification program. Uh, I'm going to focus today on LCFS verification. Uh, QAP has been around a while, and this is sort of the biggest change here in 2020 has been uh, the institution of uh, CARB's LCFS verification program, um, where auditors are now reviewing uh, alternative fuel pathways on an annual basis, uh, fuel pathway applications uh, for each submission uh, and quarterly field transaction reports along with other project reporting and petroleum food reporting um, on an annual basis. 
Um, in the 2019 rulemaking, LCFS rulemaking, uh, the verification program was established. It's mandatory for most regulated entities to uh, obtain some verification statement on an annual basis. This 2020 compliance year is the first year. So starting with August 31st, 2021, the first annual verification reports will be due. Uh, and starting in 2020, third-party verification bodies began to validate uh, alternative fuel pathway applications. So that's what EcoEngineers has been doing most of 2020. And starting here uh, in the summer of 2021, we'll be doing some of those annual verification reports. Uh, those who require verification include first fuel reporting entities in the alternate fuel space, uh, importers, producers, and producers for import, uh, exporters of fuel, and alternative fuel pathway holders uh, that have a GREED 3.0 pathway. This is a high-level timeline slide we put together a while back in preparation for LCFS verification. We've pro progressed quite a ways along here. Um, GREED 2.0 pathways will have expired at the end of 2020. So if you don't have your 3.0 pathway yet, uh, it should be in process starting in uh, your end of quarter one, you should have your 3.0 pathway established. Um, the monitoring plan is how the verification proceeds. Uh, the producer provides the monitoring plan or the regulated entity uh, should develop a monitoring plan, provide to the verifier, who then reviews it and develops their risk assessment sampling plan and how they will perform the verification. Uh, for those of you who will require verification, um, you should have your monitoring plan up to date and keep it up to date as a living document. Um, in 2019, uh, CARB staff was uh, performing validation of all pathway applications. Uh, so some folks completed their 3.0 pathways back in 2019 under CARB validation. Uh, third party verifiers started performing that validation in 2020 and will continue to do so uh, going forward. This is a slide from CARB that depicts the cycle of verification. Um, up here in the upper left corner, we've got our initial fuel pathway application to establish carbon intensity. That will go to the verifiers for validation and then to CARB for uh, final fuel pathway code certification. Between that CI application and validation of CI application step, that orange arrow, there is a uh, CARB completeness check for both Tier 1 and Tier 2 pathways. Um, that is a crucial step prior to it, the pathway application being released to the verifiers. Uh, eventually, uh, certified fuel pathway codes will be utilized on quarterly fuel transaction reports, which result in credits or deficits being issued by CARB. Um, annual pathway data will be reported by March 31st of every subsequent year, uh, which will then be verified along with the quarterly fuel transaction reports, resulting in potentially revisions to those reports. If, if mis discrepancies, misreporting, omissions are found, um, then they'll be re resubmitted and finally validated or verified at the final time. Uh, and that cycle will continue uh, through the foreseeable future. So validation of pathways, um, eco-engineers and other third-party verifiers have been performing this function throughout 2020. Um, it's been a relatively successful process so far. Validation must be completed within six months of the date of the application submission. If not, uh, fuel pathway applications are rejected without prejudice and must be resubmitted. Um, the timeline for that uh, includes that initial check from CARB staff at the Fuel Pathways um, group. That has varied in the amount of time it takes CARB staff to get through that process, a month, maybe two, maybe three months, depending on how many unique operating conditions are being uh, applied for in the process of the application. Um, so the more unique characteristics your facility may have, uh, the longer this may take. And it's best to be proactive, work with CARB staff uh, on the front end as much as possible to inform them of your operating conditions, 
and work towards approval prior to submission so that that lag time with CARB staff is, is limited and you can get your application to the verification body as quickly as possible uh, to provide them enough time to uh, complete their analysis, uh, data checks, and final reports. Upon completion of the uh, Tier 1 pathway um, in a quarter, it is deemed complete. That pathway will be able to be reported upon retroactively for that whole quarter. So let's say uh, you get your pathway deemed complete here uh, today, you would be able to report all your quarter one sales or, or purchases or whatever it may be on that fuel pathway code uh, for the whole quarter. Uh, pathways deemed complete when the validation statement is submitted to CARB staff by the verifier. That process then would go to the CARB staff to complete certification, but if you get the validation statement in, that's your deemed complete date and you can retroactively apply fuel to those fuel pathway codes for the quarter. If you have a 2.0 pathway and you do not have your 3.0 pathway yet or are in the process of gathering data for a 3.0 pathway and planning to apply, there is the option to obtain temporary pathway for an initially two quarters, potentially get that extended for um, reporting fuel into California. Uh, without a 3.0 pathway. So a 45 CI score is the default for used cooking oil and tallow, 65 for, for DCO, soy, canola. A big piece of the puzzle of verification for renewable diesel and biodiesel is specified source feedstock. Um, CARB has called out these specific specified source feedstocks, those that are waste oils that carry with them uh, a reduced carbon intensity for the fuel. Um, as requiring additional verification steps uh, to ensure that the material is indeed what it has been described as being and that the quantities are reasonable. Uh, this includes used cooking oil, tallows, animal fats, brown grease, distiller's corn oil, all of those byproduct type oils that, that carry uh, a lower CI. This can get murky uh, depending on the supply chain. Uh, verifiers are required to include chain of custody evidence review for specified source feedstocks in validation and verification uh, for supply chains where the verifier is unable to reach a positive conclusion on the feedstock type and the quantity. There is potential for that material to either be uh, identified as an unidentified feedstock for which it would uh, be not included in the application pathways or uh, in the annual verification could result in fuel that was reported on a UCO pathway, let's say, being uh, reallocated to the baseline potentially or potentially up to an animal fat pathway if it's unclear if the material was uh, a used cooking oil or tallow or a mixture of the two. Uh, this, of course, can vary in complexity from relatively simple supply chains, uh, producer collections, um, direct sales from a rendering facility or an ethanol plant to a producer, to include brokers or aggregators collecting material from multiple sources and multiple locations and uh, other entities which can causes to become difficult and potentially uh, add risk to potential credit generation or the whole entire process of verifying fuel pathway codes. So when we're looking at risks uh, for the fuel pathway codes, what have we been seeing? Um, basically, uh, fuel pathway code right represents the carbon intensity score for fuel uh, and is used to, to either generate credits or, or deficits depending on the score. Um, when you have a certified Fuel pathway code that potentially could have been applied for a provisional pathway anywhere from three months to 24 months of operational data. Um, that certified fuel pathway code CI will almost certainly be somewhat different than what you report the subsequent year uh, as operations change, uh, facilities fluctuate, process energy requirements, uh, shutdowns can cause efficiency issues. Um, or efficiency may improve year by year, right? 
So uh, we'll likely see some variation in certified fuel pathway code and what is reported on an annual basis and verified. Uh, that can result in either a higher score, which may result in uh, credit invalidation or a rebalancing of accounts, um, or potentially uh, from the specified source feedstock traceability issue, uh, there could be reported fuels that will need to be reallocated from lower CI pathways to higher CI pathways, which would again result in the potential for invalidated credits. Um, I think it's advisable for folks in the industry to look towards proactive mitigation for these types of things. Um, quarterly reviews for producers is an option within the annual verification process. Uh, the joint application is an uh, offer that CARB included in the regulation for feedstock suppliers and biodiesel producers to work in tandem on an application, uh, which would in turn make the feedstock supplier regulated entity and uh, require them to obtain their own verification. Uh, which allows them to protect the confidential business information. Also, producers could work towards uh, independent vetting of specified source feedstock suppliers, uh, potentially. Um, another option to ensure uh, you're staying within your certified CI range uh, would be ongoing tracking of your, your carbon intensity score using the Tier 1 calculator or Tier 2 calculator, whatever you were approved on for your fuel pathway codes. Uh, the other uh, report for many in the biodiesel renewable diesel space that will require verification are the quarterly fuel transaction reports um, submitted each quarter. Each year, um, verifiers will look back at your four quarterly fuel transaction reports, uh, and certain transaction types are subject to verification, including imports, production for import, production in California, exports and gain and loss of inventory. So if you have any of those types of transactions on your quarterly fuel transaction reports, you need to reach out to Verifier uh, and get verification beginning with this first round here in the 2021 for the 2020 quarterly fuel transaction reports. There's all sorts of potential for folks to have potentially uh, gone out of business over the last year, in which case those would need to be verified or there's the potential for fuel pathway codes to have need to be reallocated some fuel from one pathway code to another, uh, which could result in invalidated credits. So um, how CARB is going to handle this um, likely will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, they have included in the regulations a, a buffer account to, to work through some of these invalidated credit issues. Um, but also folks who hold these credits or have generated credits against fuel pathway codes um, may have to make the market whole. Uh, as we talked about, the joint application is a opportunity for a specified source feedstock suppliers to team with biodiesel producers, renewable diesel producers, to establish uh, their own pathway and get their own verification. Uh, this would reduce audit burden on some of the fuel producers as well as you would have control of your own information as a, as a feedstock supplier uh, and um, could result in a, a lower carbon intensity for the feedstock uh, as the default rendering energies are, are quite high. If you go through the application process, you'll establish your own rendering energy, which uh, could result in a, a lower CI and a easier marketable fuel for the West Coast anyhow. Of course, you're then a regulated entity and require uh, obtaining your own verification, which may be a disadvantage. I think that is uh, my last slide, and at this point, we will pass it back to Roxby, I believe. Thanks, Andrew. That's, that's really good. Okay, so we're going to look forward uh, briefly. We're going to look at the RINs and the um, LCFS credit markets and talk about what new technologies might be coming forward. Um, 2021, the RFS RIN outlook is uh, the, the RVOs like to be the same as 2020. Uh, we can expect increased volumes of production though from RD. There's a, been a lot of talk about how much RD is coming into the marketplace, and that's likely to, to increase volumes of RD 
dramatically. Uh, we can speculate on there'll be lower SREs, uh, and Sarah's going to speak to that uh, in, her, in her section. And overall, we're quite bullish for the RIM market in 2021. Uh, so uh, the LCFS is, is, is kind of more interesting. Um, and we've, we've done a quite deep look into this and written a study. Uh, we know for a fact that the LCFS is working. It's been copied uh, or similar programs are going to be implemented in or likely to be implemented in many states. Uh, and it's accomplishing its goal of decarboniz decarbonizing transportation. It's been very successful. And it's been very successful at launching new low carbon fuel supply and driving investments. Um, and what we're seeing from this is that with all the with the projects we're seeing is that th there are three fuels that are really uh, succeeding, perhaps better than the others, and they are the, the fuels that can use existing infrastructure, and that's electricity and renewable diesel and biomethane. For the diesel market in California, the, uh, the amount of RNG and uh, EV that can come into the marketplace is fairly fixed. We're going to, we anticipate that the RNG CI, the carbon intensity of the RNG from California is going to drop dramatically. Uh, even with the kind of the fixed volumes that are, that are available in the marketplace, the amount of credits generated are going to increase. And we see some, the number of dairy digester projects with the very low CIs going from uh, in, you know, 10 or 20 up to over 100. And that leaves uh, the remaining credit generator, the, the, the other large credit generator, to be renewable diesel. Ethanol is, is fairly fixed. We, we've got a good handle on how much, how much ethanol is coming to the marketplace and how many credits they're going to generate. Now, uh, therefore, we can, we, can, we can look at how much energy is going to be contributed by uh, renewable diesel and biodiesel and, and suggest where the market will be and how much renewable diesel and biodiesel is going to be required to make the credit market whole. We know in Q3 of this year, the, the credit market ran a, 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 a surplus. So if we, if we look at that, we can, we can make some estimates and we think around uh, 1.3 billion gallons of renewable diesel and about 400 million gallons of biodiesel will pretty much make the credit market being balanced, even with the increasing costs of the compliance curve. And, and at that point, if you have more renewable diesel than that, you'll start seeing credit surpluses in the credit bank, and it may impact the, impact the credit market going forward uh, from 2023 onwards. So let's talk about feedstocks and technologies. Uh, we have seen quite a few projects, uh, nascent projects with woody biomass. Um, municipal solid waste. Uh, so these, both these feedstocks are uh, outside of the lipid base that traditional RD and biodiesel comes from uh, and might prove to be competitive in the future. Uh, UCO, we anticipate that there's going to be more effort put into specified source feedstock tracing to make sure that UCO is what it says it is and to access larger markets for of UCO so that they can be used for the fuel industry. And there's likely to be other innovations such as increasing oil yields for crops uh, and planting of other crops to generate oil. And technology, um, there's potential new technology for um, generating D975 diesel from, uh, from other sources besides the liquid-based uh, feedstocks. The, the importance of this is that if you don't make D975 out of your, out of your plants, then you qualify as a buyer intermediary and you don't get RINs for your fuel. Uh, and that's been a, a, a large hurdle, which seems to have been overcome recently. And then there are the potentials for lowering the CI of renewable diesel, uh, which are from RNG, from methane, from steam methane reforming of, you know, uh, to make hydrogen, and potentially carbon capture and sequestration uh, of CO2 from the plant. 
Uh, and with that, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Sarah Caswell, who is going to talk about um, different markets and the new administration. There you go, Sarah. Thank you. As you'll see, there are several significant opportunities over the next few years for biodiesel and renewable diesel stakeholders to impact key rulemakings and legislation that can help drive further investment and production in the industry. For instance, as Roxby and Andrew discussed, by all accounts, the low carbon fuel standard has successfully helped to drive the biodiesel and renewable diesel markets. The body that regulates the LCFS, the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, began a major rulemaking process last fall to update the regulation. This will involve an informal process during which CARB staff hold a series of workshops on specific topics, after which stakeholders will have two weeks to submit written comments. And then it will involve um, a formal process during which CARB will issue a, a proposed rule, which may include some of the suggestions staff receive during the informal part of the workshop process. Stakeholders will have an opportunity to submit formal written comments on the proposed rule that CARB will consider before issuing a final rule. And that final rule will um, represent the update to, uh, to the regulation. The timing of the final rule is unclear right now. It could come as early as January 2023 and as late as January 2025. The industry will also have the opportunity to impact potential emerging markets in states beyond California. This list represents just some of the states and locations where clean fuel programs exist or where legislation is somewhere along the legislative process. Whether it's being considered, it's, has, it's already been introduced, or it's been passed out of committee, for instance. Biodiesel and renewable diesel stakeholders are and should be engaged on each of these to ensure the programs will continue to drive the industry. President Biden has made it clear that climate is a top priority of his administration. He has elevated the issue to the cabinet level and he's directed that all agencies consider climate impacts in everything they do. His new um, Department of Agriculture Secretary, Tom Vilsack, was the USDA Secretary during the entire Obama administration, and he's the former governor of Iowa. This is significant to the biodiesel and renewable diesel industries because we know Vilsack's record of supporting biofuels and the RFS. And the industry will have a clear cabinet level champion as the administration moves forward with its work. The Senate recently confirmed Pete Buttigieg to head the Transportation Department and is expected to confirm former North Carolina Environment Department head Michael Regan and former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm to lead the EPA and Department of Energy, respectively. Biden and Buttigieg, in particular, have stressed that policies to drive EVs and their infrastructure will be key to the administration's work to achieve the president's ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals. As an aside, the biofuels industry has begun to talk about the need for decarbonization and not electrification so that those policies that move forward are fuel agnostic. Secretary Vilsack, has stated publicly that he will work with other agency heads to stress the need for policies that drive biofuels. And the last thing I'll mention here uh, concerns the EPA. Regan is thought to be relatively new to the RFS. However, there's already senior political staff in place at the EPA that helped implement the law under the Obama EPA. The 2021 and 2022 proposed RVOs are expected to come out as a combined proposed rule sometime in the May to July time period. The 2021 RVOs are expected to be finalized earlier than the 2022 RVOs, 
but both are expected to be finalized by the statutory November 30th deadline. On the SRE issue, the last minute SREs that the Trump administration granted were stayed by a court. The Biden EPA is not expected to grant SRE petitions to the, ex to the same extent or in the same manner as the Trump EPA. They're likely to only do so when actual economic need is demonstrated. In addition, waived gallons could be reallocated among remaining obligated parties instead of going away from the RVO levels entirely. There will be significant opportunity for the biodiesel and renewable diesel industries to advocate for federal legislation that will impact them during this Congress. In the near term, Congress is expected to take up a 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill and an infrastructure bill. Both pieces of legislation will include provisions to stimulate U.S. job growth, including in the clean energy economy. Longer term, Congress will begin working on the ne next reauthorization of the Farm Bill, which now includes an energy title, and the next version is expected to include a new climate title, perhaps. In addition, the dollar biodiesel tax credit that was reauthorized at the end of 2019 expires at the end of 2022. So there may be an opportunity um, to either extend it again or to uh, recraft it <laughs> as uh, the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee consider tax legislation going forward. Roxby, back to you. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, summary slide for for um, by, di by diesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we think that by diesel uh, uh, and Renewable diesel will be used for heavy goods transportation for the foreseeable future. Uh, sustainable jet fuel is one of the key solutions for airlines to meet sustainability fuel goals. Uh, it's going to be very hard for any fuel to replace uh, the high energy density from, uh, from a liquid fuel. And, and these fuels are, uh, are key for the US and the world to meet its climate goals, to decarbonize the economies. And I, I think also that there is potential for, for um, renewable diesel and biomass, other biomass-based diesel, biodiesel, to achieve carbon neutrality in their fuels, be it from, from innovative feedstocks or innovative processes uh, that will eventually drive us to carbon neutrality. Thank you very much, everyone. And I think we're going to move to the question and answers. Hey, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And Roxby, I think, can we uh, repeat, or maybe Andrew, some of those important deadlines that are coming up um, in terms of um, LCFS verification and, and what producers will need to need to look forward toward? Andrew, do you want to take that? I, I'm happy to. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're, you're, you're the, the oldest expert. Sure, um, of course. Uh, March 31st is the deadline for annual fuel pathway reports for those fuel pathway holders who have GREE 3.0 pathways. Uh, March 31st is also the deadline for the quarter four fuel transaction report, um, which would be the final one for 2020. Um, and then uh, upon submission of the quarter four report or your annual fuel pathway report, the verifiers will begin the work of verifying and um, need to have their reports in by August 31st of this year. Um, so that's Those are the dates to keep in mind. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so what is the view on feedstocks for these renewable fuels, as in will there be enough feedstock? Uh, it's, it's a really good question, uh, but I think if the feedstock, us feedstock prices go up with the increasing demand, with the demand in the marketplace, and you'd anticipate that uh, 
the supply will grow with it. There might be lag, there will be some there's some gearing that will have to happen to the economy, but I think it will it will catch up. Uh, Raxby, maybe you know this one too. Uh, can you tell us the volumes of RD currently being produced in the US and Europe or elsewhere in the world? Um, I can... Or prospectively, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, can <laughs> build like it. I haven't got the numbers to hand. Uh, for, for the US, you saw there's about 450 uh, million gallons produced of RD uh, in the US. Uh, last year that generated drains and there's a few D6 drains from other and the import and the imported uh, was about 300 million gallons so that's they're, they're the ones that impact the US so 700 to 800 million gallons is my ballpark estimate for the US and most of those plants have announced large expansions Diamond Green, Altair, Neste, IEG have all are all expanding their plants and there are there are a multitude of other plants being developed, be it new plants or conversions of old refineries. There's three or four of those uh, out there as well. So I'd, I'd anticipate that there's, there's going to be a loss of extra volume that, that can be added to the marketplace by 2023. Uh, going a little back to your answer on the feedstocks for renewable fuels, we had a follow up here. Um, is that new supply ag based or waste based? what you were talking about or a mix of both it will be a mix of both uh, i think the 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 uh waste base is limited and the expansion of that market is depends on how strong audit trails are uh the the or the uh sea based uh is likely just to increase because of uh, the price being driven up for those oils um, how about question on LCFS verification? What are the main components of the monitoring plan? <laughs> I know, I know eco engineers can help you with your monitoring plan. Aside from that, Roxy, Andrew. Andrew, I can do this. There are three main sections. There's a general requirement section. There is a uh, 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 fuel pathway section, and then there's an LRT section. The LRT section is, is easier. It's just making sure that all your documentation support your volumes that you report in the LRT is in place. Uh, the fuel pathway code is, is slightly more extensive and it, it, it looks at all the feedstock transportation, transportation distances, how equations are being used, how volumes are aggregated, uh, all those sorts of things. And then there are general provisions which are uh, which lean towards what quality systems are in place and how effective is the metering and how well is the metering monitored. Uh, essentially, anything that goes into your fuel pathway has to be um, has to be explained about how that data comes about. And I'm sure Andrew can add to that as well. Yeah, that's that's great, Raxby. Um, for uh, the very precise details that are also vague at the same time, you can go to the LCFS regulation 95491.1 subsection C. <laughs> you can read all about it um, for sure. Could you explain how the third party verification could or would apply to a fuel marketer in California? That depends on. Um, it depends on if you're an importer or you're the last report, you're a credit generator. If you're an importer or a credit generator and you're over 6,000 metric tons of uh, credits that could be generated in fuel that's imported or that, you are, uh, that you've generated and selling into the marketplace without obligation, then you will be subject to verification. Here we have a question. Um that says if the california market becomes saturated with the announced rd capacity such that the rd becomes the price setting fuel what effect will that have on lcfs prices uh is it realistic to plan on 200 plus dollars uh lcfs lcfs credit prices over the next five to ten year time frame we have generated three separate models uh 
in our report that basically our details report. all all of that. We can talk about that offline if you would like. Yeah, feel free to contact us if you want any of uh, additional information about our report that's uh, looking ahead at the LCFS market in the next couple of years. The pricing of RD, has it reached the level of competitive fuel anywhere? Most RD in, in the US is sold at the California marketplace. And I do not believe that that is going to change at least for a year or so uh, until the other markets develop. The Oregon market is starting to see volumes, start to see volumes in 2019. Uh, some goes to British Columbia. Uh, I would say it will depend on the new LCFS programs that come about where the RD goes. Um, here's one that you might be able to answer, Sarah. Uh, it says, the Obama administration was not overly favorable to the biofuel industry. You mentioned that biointermediaries are still not able to get RINs. Can you expand on that? I don't think I mentioned that, but I'm aware of the issue. Um, I think, can I jump in a little bit? Yeah. Okay. If, if, I, I if expect you... there to be a decision on that shortly, but. <laughs> my individuals don't get, don't get a don't get RINs because it's been substantially altered, and I think there are issues with using them that, uh, that have to be the, the precedent might create problems for allowing them. So I think there have, there's a lot of precedents that have to be thought through and and analysed before they can really say yes, we can do this. And there's probably going to be a number of caveats. That's just that's just my opinion. Uh, it's, it seems to be a rather dangerous precedent to set. And this is, I don't know if this is a question that we're even, um, that we can answer, but it's something that that's, I've, I've thought about a couple of times. If one looks at the full environmental impact of batteries, take into account the mining of heavy metals to create them, um, one would see that EVs are not actually better for the environment and Tesla has done a, a great job of selling this message. Um, but so what are, you, what are your thoughts on, on that and how they uh, play into the biofuels industry with electric vehicles? I think that goes into the um, messaging that the biofuels industry is starting to um, put forward in uh, Washington, D.C. and other emerging markets that we talked about during the presentation in terms of stressing decarbonization and not electrification. There appears to be um, a, an education effort that needs to happen because for various reasons, the and, and you mentioned Tesla's success in, in terms of messaging on EVs, um, there seems to be an effort um, among uh, leaders, political leaders around the country, uh, Governor Newsom in California, President Biden, others, mentioning EVs and the potential of EVs to uh, help us achieve our lofty greenhouse gas emissions reductions goals. And it appears that they may not be educated or have taken into account the full life cycle of the batteries involved with EVs, and also the potential for decarbonization from the biofuels industry, which has made significant strides in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions since the last RFS was passed at the federal level in 2007. There was just a report out, I think this week or last week, that the average greenhouse gas emissions reductions from ethanol is actually 46 percent. Um, at the time in 2007, the, ba the baseline, the threshold to um, qualify for the RFS, as everyone knows, is 20 percent greenhouse gas reduction. So, you know, the biodiesel industry, renewable diesel, ethanol, all biofuels across the board have just made significant strides and should be a part of the decarbonization effort as policies go forward at the administrative level and at Congress. And so it's just, it's, it's, it's the onus is on us as an industry to help educate policymakers and leaders. 
Uh, this is a good one to kind of piggyback that, Sarah. Are all other, jurisdi are other jurisdictions likely to adopt the CARB assessment mes method for issuing LCFS credits? Uh, you know, with all these other states that are creating programs, what, what are we, is it going to be piecemeal? How can we help it be the same? Well, um, two things. First, um, in terms of how, how can you help it be consistent, that the answer is engagement. I mean, the only way to help it be consistent is to ensure that um, you're engaged in all of those emerging markets where all of the bills and legislation and regulations are being considered um, on that list. Number two, in terms of the structure of the clean fuels legislation and policies that are uh, moving forward or existing, they're mostly market-based systems like CARB um, with the R put forward with the LCFS. But for instance, um, Iowa Governor uh, Reynolds just recently uh, had introduced a piece of legislation to create uh, a volume type of system, like sort of structured based on the RFS, which is very different than the market-based system, mm -hmm. um, in order to encourage a certain percentage of biodiesel and ethanol in the fuel supply in Iowa um, throughout the year. So it really depends on uh, the jurisdiction in terms of the structure. But engagement, engagement, engagement is the mm -hmm. is the key, right? For sure. No more feedstock questions here. Can we uh, talk a little bit about the different feedstocks and what's kind of most desirable? What is um, you know easiest to get? What is going to have the best scores? Things like that. Do you want me to take this one, Rashi? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so in terms of general CI rankings in, in the LCFS space for feedstocks, UCOs tend to be the lowest. Um, then you're going to see DCO, distillers corn oil, then uh, then tallow, then your, then your crops, uh, crop oils, soybeans, uh, and canola. I'm not going to be able to provide insight on prices or markets because I, I just don't <laughs> Yeah, but maybe Roxy could. I'm sure it's a case by case basis as well. Yeah, it depends where on the CI score for the plant, but that's roughly right. I mean, the UCO has its own problems. They're the hardest because uh, you have to do all the contact, the tracing, uh, have chain of custody. And then, of course, the seed oils are the easiest. It's, it's very easy to get seed oils and just use them. They, they tend to be cleaner as well. Plants should be easier. You have to do less pre-treatment. So. Um, does the residual waste stream after the feedstock has been processed into a fuel have an impact on the CI? Uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends, <laughs> on, <laughs> it depends on, the, on the waste and how it's being used. Whether it's really a, truly a waste or not. Got it. Uh, yeah, so what's the current status of the clean fuel standard in Canada? And uh, will that create an export market for these fuels? Roxby, do you want to take that since I think you've been working with that? Sure. The this initial regulation has been released, and um, we're seeing we go through what it contains at the moment. The regulation will come into force December the first, twenty twenty two. And yeah, I'm sure there will be some export into the marketplace depending on individual situations. I think we went over this a little bit, but we could bear to repeat it. Uh, what is the forecasted growth of renewable diesel production? And similarly, what is the expected gro growth of biodiesel production? Um, there aren't many biodiesel plants uh, being announced to be built. Uh, however, there's a lot of RD plants if you if you add up all the RD plants, you'd expect over four billion gallons by 2024, I believe. And that's just, and you have to make an assessment on on will those will those nameplates actually exist at that time. Uh, so it's hard to do a prediction. I think that's that gives you the maximum 
and then you have to do assessment of how feedstock prices move, uh, how much renewable diesel can the California market stand both in terms of volume of the fuel, the, the liquid fuel market is only likely to be three and a half billion gallons for, for uh, diesel, and that's going to be taken up by biodiesel and renewable diesel. One advantage though uh, is that biodiesel uh, is effectively an oversupply to Californians. There's something like 1.1 billion gallons that had at least 2.0 pathways into California. And that has kept the prices relatively low. And the prevalence of an R80 B20 blend in truck stops where uh, you can monetize both the biodiesel and the renewable diesel is, is increasing rapidly. And I think that's partly driving the biodiesel growth that we've seen in the credit generation. So with that, uh, I think that you'll find, and uh, the other thing about renewable diesel is it mitigates NOx uh, for an, under the alternative diesel fuel regulation that's required to be met in California. So I think those two, th those are going to go hand in hand. A uh, biodiesel will push renewable diesel growth because it's required to mitigate NOx, and renewable diesel will grow because biodiesel is it's very lucrative to sell. Uh, have you heard anything about opt-in mechanisms for allowing marine fuels to generate LCFS credits? Andrew, do you know of any? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not I, sure about the marine fuels. I, I think there'd be decent on it, but I'm not sure if it's in the regulation yet. I know that there was a presentation during the first workshop uh, at CARB last fall, uh, the first workshop to update the LCFS regulation. Um, part of the updates for the LCFS regulation will be substantive, so I guess we'll see um, in terms of whether or not they would allow that in the final. I do have one here. Um, it, one last question. If anybody has anything else, we're running, running low, so um, type in your questions if you have any. Um, is there anything a soybean crusher can do to help the carbon intensity score for soybean oil or renewable, renewable diesel? I'm not sure the uh, most of the contribution from soy, uh, I think it's from the ILOC and the farm practices. I'm not sure how much the crush adds, but if you can measure the energy and uh, in the crush, and uh, we we can we can definitely model it for you to show you if it will make money or not lower the CI score. Uh, you would have to be a joint applicant with the with a producer. So the way that would go is. We'd model the plant, see what the CI score is, uh, and then uh, if you're selling into the fuel industry, then you say, okay, we, we have this this crush is saving you half a point of CI uh, because of its efficiencies, and therefore, can we can you be a joint applicant on, with us, and would our soy be worth more? Do you know? Do we know when there will be a decision on whether biointermediaries qualify for RINs? Um, I need to double check, but I think that there is language in um, the omnibus spending bill that was signed by President Trump in December directing EPA to inform uh, Congress in terms of how it was going to rule on it. So one way or another, uh, within, I want to say 90 days. Um, so that would put us to March, April, but it didn't say how to rule. So, so that comes to the end of our questions. Uh, if anybody has anything else, feel free to type it in in the next couple seconds. Um, if not, any any final thoughts, Roxby, Sarah, Andrew? Thank you all for attending and listening to us. Yeah. And hope to hear from you later, if you have yep. any more Thanks. questions.